All right, all right, all right, all right, man. Y'all know what time it is. We back with another episode of the Reentry Journey. I am your host, Cordell Sims, and today our guest today has a has a, a journey and a, an a amazing story, a, a kind of like an against all lies story against those of us that's been against all lies. There's another layer, and today we're going to really dig deep into that. And I like to bring and welcome to the reentry journey. Our guest, Mr. Matt Melvin. Welcome to the reentry journey. Bullet behind bars. Welcome to the reentry journey, Mr. Matt Melvin. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time and having me on the show. Oh, uh, thank you a lot for uh, coming in and, and, and being a guest on the show and reaching out to me. It really means a lot. Uh, I'm truly honored, as I told you earlier on the phone. I truly believe that we all have a story. Uh, I don't you know, uh, discriminate against nobody. We come from the same struggle. We go through the same struggle, no matter what type of lifestyle that we live or choose, we, we all go through it. And, um, to have you apart and share your story, what is, is what, what, what's only honestly to me, just to be honest, is, is another layer of, of what goes on in, in prison that a lot of people don't um, want to discuss. Um, and I thank you for willing to discuss your story and, and share who you are and share what you faced and, and what you went through and, and how to overcome it. So, again, thank you a lot for being my guest on the reentry journey. So let the people know about um, Mr. Matt Melvin. I, I, where you come from? How'd you grow up? I was born in 1981 in Lowell, Massachusetts. Uh, I was bullied uh, very early on uh, by the by the neighborhood kid. Uh, his name was Brian Wagner. And he bullied me throughout um, middle school, elementary school. Um, my parents decided uh, that Lowell was not going to be a conducive environment for raising a child. And they moved, uh, up, moved our family up to Shelburne, Vermont. Uh, that was the biggest mistake they could have made. Uh, Vermont is a very uh, seclusionary environment. Uh, it was very, very hard to, for me to make friends and to adapt to uh, a completely different environment that I was not accustomed to. So that move, how did that move personally on the inside make you feel? It felt, it, it made me feel very, very uncomfortable. Um, I actually had a friend um, that lived actually next to Brian uh, named Tim Dunbar that we were really good friends, close, you know, he had a swimming pool. I love swimming. So I would swim in his pool, um, you know, after school. And all of a sudden now uh, I'm being replanted in an environment that I don't know anybody. Mm. Right. Mm. And so, from, so what was like, like now that you're in this new environment and going from that, that point on? I was bullied throughout elementary school and high school. Uh, I ended up going to Rice Memorial High School, a Catholic school. Uh, so I don't, the bullying was not as severe there as it would have been if I went up to a public high school. Mm. And, you know, going through, going through this phase uh, 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 and going through the, this time in your life and, and, you know, it seems like everywhere you're going, um, you getting bullied in a sense. Well, I ain't not saying right. since you getting bullied. Let's just say you getting bullied. Yeah. Let's be on sugar. You getting bullied. How, you know how, what kind of questions are you asking yourself? Or, or like, um, why is this happening to me? What is it about me? Or what? What? What is this? That you, what are you asking yourself? One, I would say because I'm gay, and that's not well accepted. And at that time, I was heavy. I was a very heavy individual. 
So both of those did not serve my purpose to being accepted. Mm, okay. And I, 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 I've listened and I read that also that you, you have autism as well. So did that add on to it as well? But did that play a part? Uh, kind of like, you know how, how people are and, and all this, they find another reason to bully you. Oh, right. he's gay. I'm a bully. Oh, he has autism. I'm a bully. Absolutely. That um, was a, another struggle that I faced on a daily basis, not only in trying to learn the information in the schools, but also trying to make friends. And some things that I may have said would be misconstrued by other individuals. Uh, you know, for example, they, you know, they might say, I like you. And they might misinterpret that as you want a relationship with them. Right. Right. Uh, okay. And and what was what what was your parents like growing up as well? Um, my mother's taught has uh, taught for 30 years at the U UVM. She's a registered nurse. And my mother's been emotionally abusive throughout my entire life. My father uh, was a Vietnam veteran. And we also believe that he uh, had Agent Orange, and that may have had an effect on me as well. Um, oh, wow. And for 36 years, I was seeing mental health counselors in and out, and it, I never really found any benefit to it. Mm. And why didn't you, and you said you never found any benefit to it. Why didn't you think you found any benefit towards the mental health counseling that you were receiving? I, in my experience, they were just taking notes and mm. they didn't really offer me any suggestions or okay. if they did ask, offer suggestions, I would try those out and it wouldn't work. Now, later on, I discovered EMDR um, and different techniques to use, um, but I still found it challenging to cope with the toxic environment not only at home and then in the schools okay and so let's talk about you said that you think that you all believe that your father has suffered from agent orange for those that don't know can you explain um a little bit about agent orange agent orange i, I i'm not a, an expert on it however Agent Orange was in Vietnam, and um, it was a disease that uh, resulted from the uh, warm, very warm climate. Okay, and so what what was your what was your relationship like with your father? Being because I'm, I'm just me painting it up, and as as a person from the outside looking, in, I'm thinking, you know, a father who's in the military, you know, that they have these rules and. And, and they very strict, this in my eyes, in my opinion. And my, my have... father's father was, uh, but my father's a pushover. He does everything that my mother tells him to do. Okay. All right. Uh, and how he, he also how... has, uh, he's, he just recently had so shoulder surgery and he has trouble walking as a result of Agent Orange because his feet are not flat. Mm. from okay. stretching in, in the mud in, in, in Vietnam. Right. Mm. And what was your relationship like with your father? Well, anything that I said to him would go back to my back mother. To my and my mother, mother is right. sort of the general. Uh, my mm. mother took on the role of being the general in the military. Okay. Mm. And nothing I ever did was good enough. You know, she never thought that I could sell Cutco cutlery um a um knife company uh out in oleon new york handcrafted made in the usa and i sold two million dollars in the three years that i was with them wow mm. so it was an important it was important that you most definitely had to believe in yourself i had to believe in myself because i, I have two alcoholic younger brothers and two emotionally abusive parents and um, a family that is probably there, you know, a family, whether it's aunts, uncles, whatever you want to call it, that's very, very dysfunctional. Some of them I've never even met. Okay. All right. 
And, and I, so, I find that that's a common theme and with most people that are in prison, they come from an, a dysfunctional family. Exactly. Yeah, I definitely I definitely can agree with that because in our household, when I grew up, either someone was either alcoholic or they was an addict. They was addicted to crack. It was either you was addicted to crack or you was addicted to, addicted to alcohol. So it was a lot of dysfunction, fights, uh, a lot of different things going on in the, in, in the household. So I most definitely um, can agree and concur with that. So, right. and so my mother has played the victim her whole life. Everything okay. that goes wrong in her life is always my fault. And right. I remember saying to her a week ago, maybe if you weren't emotionally abusive, I wouldn't have a criminal record. And she cannot see that. Right. She and then, has no ability to be able to see that. Yeah. And, and, and she lives in fear. Fear controls every part of her life. Right. And so how so what what led up to you going to prison? How did this how did um I can kind of see a direct link coming from the, the environment with the household, the dysfunctional and things of that nature. So what so how did uh prison come about? You going to prison? I would say it started in my teens with speeding, going 90, 95 miles an hour on the highway because I was mm. angry, I was frustrated, not okay. being accepted in, in all the environments. So that led to traffic citations, having to go to court. And that slowly led up to, I got a job at a car dealership. Uh, I sold several cars. The company, the Freedom Nissan decided they weren't gonna pay me. So I retaliated and stole one of their cars. Mm, okay. And so you, you, you're saying that, you know, you, you recognize the pattern as a teenager, you was, you was speeding, you know, and a I lot of- I was speeding. I was walking out of restaurants without paying. I was driving off at gas stations without paying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Part of my autism <laughs> is my impulsive my impulsivity and trying to get away with it. Okay. You know, can, I, can I do something that's illegal and get away without, without get, get away with it without getting caught? And there were several times that I did it and didn't got away with it. Hmm. And so what was it like going to prison um, for the first time? You you go to prison and uh, especially being um, a homosexual, you go to prison, gay. You know, what was that like coming through the door um, openly? <laughs> uh, hold on. Oh, oh, let's say openly. I, um, because, I would say I was openly gay then. As okay. I am, the second time I was much more openly gay. But I want to back okay. that up for just one second. Um, through the court case... Um, we, uh, my family and I petitioned the court for me to be allowed into, into the mental health court. Um, okay. Being that I, I suffer from autism, 36 years of seeing a counselor. And the judge in the case, Judge Jeffrey Crawford, and, a, 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 and another gentleman named Bob Wolford, who worked at the Howard Mental Health Center, both made the decision that I, was, I didn't meet the criteria to be allowed in the mental health court. Now, oh, if wow. I was allowed in the mental health court, I actually would not have ever gone to prison. I would have had to report once a week to the court and provided I didn't pick up an additional offense, I would have never spent time behind a bar. But because they didn't feel I was criteria, they sent me to prison. They mm. And I was in units uh, with hardened criminals. And I was essentially many times isolated because inmates would say that I was propositioning them or asking them for sex when in fact I never did that. Right. And so they, they, they so a lot of times you found yourself in, in, in segregation. Yes. I, I, I spent a significant amount of time in segregation. Okay. And so the, uh, this is your first, this is your first, one. You, you know, you come in, um, you were, you in there with the hard nosed, hardened criminals, um, you feeling like you ain't even supposed to be here. Be you know where you're supposed to be, um, but because of the judge and the mental health person and their feelings and what they got going against you, they telling you that you belong to prison. You know you're not being in there, and you're going through what you're going through while incarcerated. You get out. Um, what was it like the first time when you got out? The first time you got out, what was that like? So I had actually met a, a man behind bars, a pastor that came in, a man named uh, Mark Fay, 
he brought me to his church, uh, Community Bible at that time. Now it's um, vibrant. And he got me a job uh, working at Country Kitchen as a bre bread root guy. Early morning start times, you know, two, three in the morning and driving a bread root. And that worked for a little while. Uh, when I was going to church, the pastor wanted me to take conversion therapy. And for those folks that don't know what conversion therapy is, it's a course to take a, a gay individual and make them straight. And oh, no. That was that caused me to really question what kind of God would want me to be somebody that I'm not. And it really changed my perspective on religion. Okay. You know, uh, so you, 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 in a sense, you kind of felt like, because the way I'm looking at it, to me, it kind of sounds like a scheme and a, a, and a force play. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to help you out. Um, but the scheme behind it is, and the force play is, we're going to try to, uh, we're going to make you straight. Or you got to take this program to, to make, to we're not accepting you for you. Right. Exactly. Oh, wow. That's crazy. And so when you start to question religion, how, how, how did that make you feel? And what direction did you go after that? I was done with religion. Uh. And I was just going to do it on my own. And that didn't work very well. Uh, uh. That resulted in my going back to prison. But I will share with you that um, several years later, I was actually driving on 495, headed to see a woman who was my friend for 36 years. Uh, and I was driving towards Fitchburg from Maine, and I was literally going 70 miles an hour in the in the middle lane. And the next thing I know, the a, a Lexus came down the other side and crossed in front of me, and I could have been killed at that at that moment. That was the decision that I had made to turn my life over to God that what I was doing was not working. And that if I continued on my path, that I would probably end up in prison the rest of my life. Right. Now, and that was in 2016. I ended up in jail in uh, for the second time in 2016. However, the cases that they were prosecuting against me occurred between 2009 and 2013. Okay. The All government right. had actually spent $500 going after me from a case from three years ago at that point. Oh, wow. Mm. And a man named Aaron Noble, who's the former chief of police, who just received $200,000 from the town of Shelburne to just go away. He wouldn't go on a ride along. He was, he did everything in his power to get the government to indict me. Okay. And so, and this is, and, and remind you what you're talking about that you um getting indicted for, was it before the first time that you went to prison, the actual um case? The first they, time I went to prison was 2004 to 2005. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is out and then you're out this, and you out. And I was out until I was indicted in 2016, 16. Okay. for money laundering Mind and all right. several counts of identity theft. Okay. And so let me fill you in on a little bit of the background on that. Yeah, because it's a space. I'm about to say it's kind of it's a space in between. Correct. There, right. So though the two, it was the case was between 2009 and 2013. Yeah. Um, I had actually gotten a job with a third party merchandising company, and okay. was going into stores to do work. I had actually talked to a couple coworkers and asked them to give me their social security card and driver's license. So I could get jobs in their name because I couldn't pass a background check. And oh, okay. I had asked them for their information and I was using their information to do work. Mm. Okay. And you said you was using this because you, you couldn't pass a background check. Like, exactly. you know, and, and that kind of explains to um that sometimes the extremes and the measures that we have to go through coming out of prison and not being able to pass a background check, but trying to be able to survive out here. And so, you know, you took it to the, the measure that you needed to take to in order to get a job. Right. Okay. Exactly. 
and then then you know they get you on the investigation and you go back to prison. They were first in 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 looking into me for state charges. Okay. And then when they saw that I had prior theft charges, they thought that they would go so, after me federally. Right. And, um with the federal statutes, if you're found guilty on identity theft, it's a mandatory minimum of two years. So if I'm found guilty on even one single charge of identity theft, it's two years automatic in prison. Mandatory minimum federal right. federal guideline. Yeah, because I did I did I did some state time and I also I've been I've been in prison five times, man. So I'm straight up I was a crash ball. I mean to be honest with you, but I know how the federal system works. Uh and so I know exactly about the mandatory minimums. So you, you, you and I know the difference in between fe- fighting a state case right and a federal case. Right. So what, uh, the federal system has a 96% conviction rate. They the the federal grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. And <laughs> you also have to remember Cardell that the government has unlimited resources unlimited amount of money that they can spend they can yeah i know as many attorneys on a case i just and, watched the case and they will put as many witnesses on the case even if you don't know them or they ain't got nothing to do with you correct i just saw a case of a man who was a felon in possession of a firearm uh that decided he was going to take it to trial oh um, yeah he was all oh, now three attorneys from the government were used in that trial. In that trial. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They use they use at least two. I know for two for a fact. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if they use three because I, I I can see that happen, especially in trial. Um, whoever that guy was, I don't know why he went with, with the trial fell in possession. But uh, um, a huge mistake. And yeah, so I'm not <laughs> yeah, I don't under, yeah, I don't understand that one here. Uh so you go so now you're in federal prison. It's different to stay. What was uh, so it like? In- at this point, when I'm indicted in May of 2016, I am actually released on what's called pretrial release. Okay, so you're on my, pretrial. My supervisor was a woman named Parrish Gibson. She's still there. She's actually a supervisor now. She was a just a PO at that time, but she's actually moved up. In, oh, okay. In the uh, uh, in in, uh, in, the, uh, in the PO in the parole yes. in the PO bill. She she don't went from an officer to a supervisor. Right. Okay. And I was doing fine. Um, but at one point, I was asked by. Uh, so I was working, I had to report where I was working. And the both John Schroeder, who was the IRS agent and May Chow, um, who was the Secret Service, both of those two individuals investigated my case. They talked to Michael Drescher, who was the U.S. attorney at that time, and they wanted me to be to receive stricter conditions from the magistrate judge, Judge Judge Conroy. So they asked the judge to petition to require me to alert any prospective employers about the dangers uh, or ramifications of hiring a convicted felon. Oh no! Which oh, made wow. it virtually impossible. You, so you them. had you had to alert them. Yes. So, so that's like saying going to a job and they're right. like, "Yeah, um, I'm here to get the job, man." But before you hire me, I gotta let you know I, I've been to prison three or four times. I got drug charges. I got gang activity. Ah, uh, that's a setup for failure. Exactly, and that's what happened. I failed. I actually decided I was going to call uh, Parrish Gibson and pretend that I was. Um, Mr. Uh, I have to, uh, I have to print back Cosmos print back with, I can't remember the name of the company. So I pretended to be somebody, the employer, Mr. Print back and, and t- to call Parrish Gibson and tell her that M- Mr. Melvin had told me that he was a convicted felon. Well, that yeah. bit in the butt, she figured it out. She must've called print back or she knew. <laughs> right. And she violated me, and that got me put it thrown into prison. Mm. Oh wow! So you're back in prison. Well, I, I, I'm back in prison yeah. now. This is for the first time in the federal. For the first system. time, yeah. And so, what was that like? 
Well, I, I ended up going to St. Albans, which is actually where I was the first time. Um, however, I was um, I was a federal inmate now and, and not a, a state inmate. State, okay. Oh, so they had a state side and a federal side? No, kind of they put them all together. All together. Oh, wow. Whoa. Yes. Mm, okay. So, yeah. Um, so, but you, now you're a federal. Right. Oh, oh, because oh, oh, I'm remembering now. I keep you. So you're you're uh, Massachusetts, right? No, I am Vermont. Vermont. So you're in Vermont, and they do state and federal together in Vermont. In St. Albans, they have forty allotted beds for federal inmates. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So once they get to close to forty, they have to ship ship them one of the okay. federal inmates to another facility, which happened mm -hmm. to be Essex, New York, and mm -hmm. I went there. Um, I in in that facility, all federal inmates have to get classified, which means they are put in solitary confinement until they get classified. Classified, right? Meaning that I had multiple felonies on my record. My score was fairly high, and right. I ended up being put into a pod of sex, child molesters, rapists. Uh, because your class, because your classification was high, right? My my right, classification yeah. was high. Yeah, I know and exactly as a result, um, I was brutally bullied. At one time, um, the inmates actually put a table in front of my chair, uh, or in front of my do my um, cell door. They were screaming, um, "Faggot!" Oh wow! Sexual. Uh, they actually thought I was a child molester. Uh, and, you know, right. facts are is that most child molesters are white and straight, not gay. Right. And so, and they were just under the assumptions. Uh, I ain't gonna lie, I've been in there, but I've been there before. I ain't gonna sit here and act like, you know, uh, we kind of stereotype people come in, we all automatically put a tag on them just okay. from what they look like. So, yeah. Then, I, I, then I, what generally what happens is they ask, for your name, your last name, and then they'll call somebody from home and they'll look you up online. So you better tell them really why you're there because otherwise it won't be a good day. Right, exactly. And so but you it go still through this. Wasn't a good day, even though nah. when they figured out that I wasn't a child molester, they right. the, the inmates actually told the, the correctional staff that I was trying to proposition them for sex, which got me put in solitary confinement. Uh, Close custody, 23 lock hours locked in, an hour to come out. Um, I was so frustrated a, by one in particular guard, and I, I can't quite remember his name. It's in my book, uh, bullybehindbars.com, um, also on Amazon. I, I, so I don't want to quote his name unless it's accurate, but it's in my book. Um, no. And um, I actually got on the phone and told my brother that this guy, this guard was making this stuff up. And my brother said on, the, on a recorded line, I will take care of it. As a result. Oh, yeah. May you Chow, yeah, they, they came at you. May Chow. Nope. Nope. May Chow and John Schroeder actually showed up where my brother sold cars at Sure Acura in South Burlington. Mm. Oh wow! And threaten him. Mm. Mm, wow. So yeah, you go. You going through a. You going through a, a, a lot. Um, yes. In, in prison, not and, it, and it's really not just in prison. It's, it's on the outside, and not in a spilled over to the outside as well. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the guards were so upset with me and I was filling out all sorts of grievances. And for those. Oh, yeah, they was on your head. I already know how you, yeah, you was filling out grievances. Right. Oh, you had a target on you. Daily, you had a target on daily, you. I had a target on me. And at one point, the guards actually pulled me out, put me in the attorney client room and four correctional staff surrounded me. Now, they have their cameras on them. And they want to know what my end game is to writing all these grievances. Right. I have never been so scared in my life. Yeah, I do. Yeah, because you, you got yeah, 
because you ain't got no behind behind the walls. Ain't no yeah. You don't have nothing. It's just you. You just gonna have to take whatever's about to come. Correct. Yeah, I definitely understand that. So, how long was you was you incarcerated during this time? I was incarcerated for 18 months. Okay. Uh, I went to a total of eight different facilities. After I went to Essex, I was moved to Springfield, uh, then to Cheshire, New Hampshire, where is that actually? You, uh, you was in the Springfield, uh, Missouri? Vermont. Vermont. Uh, right. Then okay. I went to Cheshire County, New, um, New Hampshire, where I met... Um, Pastor Mo Wilbur, whose church I'm a part of today. Okay. Um, I went to Stratford, and Stratford was a facility that I, so I decided I was going to start taking journaling my journey through these different facilities. And a bunch of the inmates found out that I was journaling, and they actually started stealing my journal entries. Um, when I got to Stratford, they found out I was writing journal entries and the staff actually took me out of my cell and took stole my journal entries and they didn't they they did not return them you were muted for a second i said they'd have robbed you for your journals yes yes um because i saw some crazy things when i was in stratford i actually saw an individual that was on the second tier where where I was actually jump, uh, climb over the railing and actually swan dive uh, to his to he, he didn't die. He ended up uh, going to the hospital. Right. But that was oh, wow. uh, probably the most horrific thing I, I, I've ever seen in, in my life. OK, mm. so. You do 18 months and you get out for release. What was re what was life like once you got out after that, after this second uh, prison bid? I was on supervision. I was, I think I had to do three years um, on supervision. Uh, it was still a challenge to find a job. And it, it still is today. I mean, that hasn't gone away, even though today I'm not on supervision anymore. Um, in fact, I've been off it for several years. Um, mm, congratulations. I, I know how hard it is getting off that, that, that supervision. Right. Uh, because when you get out, they, they give you this form that you have to fill out every month. And uh, the form includes where you're working, where you're living, and then, uh, you know, how much assets you have in your bank. And on the back, they have some questions. One being, have you ever, have you had any contact with a convicted felon? Uh, have you possessed a firearm? Um, I can't, uh, can't remember every other question that's on there, but essentially you sign that. And if you lie on any form, uh, part of that form, it's a, it's a, they will put you back in prison. Yes, they a violation. Will right. right. Mm. So, on, on, so outside of employment, what was any other obstacles that you you, you faced after getting out of prison the second time? Because now you're not just a, a a one a one time convicted felon. Now you now you got at least two. You right. know what I'm saying? So it's the jobs. Uh, if you want to adopt a child, it it's virtually impossible because right. any any person that you know you want to adopt a child from will know about your record, and when you have you know, multiple families that are trying to adopt a child, who is that person going to choose? A person that doesn't have felonies or has felonies. Right. Yeah, uh, you yeah, can't right. serve no. on a jury. Uh, even though they say it's it's a jury of your peers, it's actually a jury of the judge's peers or the prosecutor's peers. It's not a ju jury of, of your peers. Uh, no. You can't, uh, when you want to go to the airport, uh, you can't get TSA pre-check. Um, because you have felonies on your record, so you have to stand in long lines. So you stand in long lines, yeah. And and, and, and it's crazy. I mean, and, and people, normal people don't know that. Like, like normal people don't 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 know that that, that exists. Right. You know that um, you don't can't get the pre check because of the felony. Correct. Yes. Um, if you want to find an apartment, a lot of places that want to rent from you, they want to run a background check on you. Sure do. Sure do. 
And obviously, you can't possess a firearm. Right. And so, you, in the sense, especially in today's environment, that's basically saying you can't protect yourself or your family. You can't ensure your safety, correct. And um, I will tell you, on, on Father's Day of last year, um, at 5.30 at night, our doorbell rang, and it was actually some somebody that I had served in prison with actually thought he was going to come live here. Oh, wow. Mm, mm, mm. Because the Shelburne News had put out where I was living. And I will also share with you that um, when I tried to get off supervision the first time, the government fought tirelessly to not allow me to get off supervision. Um, and that's standard. When you apply to get off supervision the first time, you will always be denied. Um, the second time I was actually allowed to get off supervision, even though the prosecutor and Shelburne News, who vehemently were trying to petition the court to not allow me to get out of uh, off supervision. And the Shelburne News actually produced the chart that told uh, in the article, they told what church I was attending at that point. Oh, man. Oh, wow. Mm, yeah, it's crazy. It's like, it's like you really against all odds. Uh, uh, it is. Uh, 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 where you at? Right. Um, with, with you going through that, how do you um, keep your focus and don't let it all throw you off of your path or your purpose? So I, st- I joined an organization called Crucible. It's a Christian organization where men come with all sorts of issues and try to take ownership and stop blaming other people and um, they can, it's, it's a fellowship of men that can relate to other men's struggles. Okay. Mm. So let's talk about, uh, let's, look at, let's, let's talk about Bully Behind Bars, your books. Yes. Um, let's just talk about it. Uh, I like the title and, and I like how you, you put it together, man. Um, honestly, it makes for an interesting read. Bully Behind Bars, a gay Christian Trump, Trump supporter. Just that that three three four words right there, um, that that's an interesting uh, title. So in this world today, um, you know, where religion, politics, uh, it's like everything is against each other. Um, and some people say you can't you can't be Christian and be gay or, or this and that. You know, the, you know the hate in in the majority of people have for Trump. So. Uh, what kind of reviews and, and, and any backlash that you have you faced off the title? Yes, um, I had a lot of trouble ha- finding editors to help me with my book. I had people that wouldn't even touch it because Trump was in the name. Mm. Exactly uh, because the you know the English um, an audience, the people that would be critiquing my book, editing. Um, are all from the, the literature English um, background, which is a a a liberal background. Yeah, right. Exactly. So, uh, so what 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 can the people that that's tuning in right now? What what can they find in the book? Tell them about the book. My my book is my journey from when I was born to being bullied through school to uh, being raped while I was in in prison by three men from the Aryan Brotherhood. Uh, And my book is for people that are, you know, maybe they're speeding like I was originally. Maybe they're engaging in pot. Those are small steps that could lead to making bad decisions. And, and that's what my, I don't want any, I wrote this book because I don't want anyone else to go through the hell and torment that I went through. If you're thinking about doing something, think about the consequences. You know, I think that if they had a program when I was the first time I, I went to jail or before I even went to jail to see the environment that I would be in. I probably would have thought twice before I would have made these decisions. Right. So you sound like a, like a scare straight program or something like that. That's, that's exactly <laughs> the program. Right? Hey, but it took you in there. Yes. Yeah. I actually went through one of the programs. I ain't gonna lie. I went through one of the programs and it probably been um, like a year later, I was in the same prison that they took me into. That was the crazy part. Like I just, I just didn't listen to it. 
um I, I had a friend that went uh, i think he was on the tour with us and he was worse than i was he was in there arguing with they took us on a scary straight he was in there arguing with the people that was locked up about the fight and now he's doing he's doing life with life in prison with doubt man it, it's crazy but yeah I, but i know some people that been through scare straight and it really worked so you feel like if you went to the scare straight it would have worked I, I I don't know. I think it would have, but you you know hindsight's twenty twenty. Right. Um, I also think that if Judge Crawford had allowed me into the mental health court, um, it would have made it an uh, impact too. And mind you, I don't know if you you'll, you'll find this, but Judge Crawford will actually show up twice because he was actually my sentencing judge in the federal system as well. Yes. Oh man. Oh yeah, that's dirty right there. He was on you. At, at that time, <laughs> he, he was on you. Was a federal judge. He had actually moved in. He had moved up. He was a state judge um, in 2004, and he was a federal judge in 2016. Oh, man, that's crazy. Hmm. And so I always ask this one last, this one final question to everybody who comes on the reentry journey. Um, if you had one word to describe your journey, what would that one word be and why? heartache mm, oh why you say heartache because it, it was not just a heartache for me it you know and i think that a lot of people don't realize that when 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 somebody makes a bad decision whether it's suicide whether it's going to prison it's a domino effect it just doesn't a, a, affect the one person that ends up you know behind bars it's it, it affects the family um because your name is in the paper uh, it affects relationships that families may want to have. And now all of a sudden your name is in the paper and neighbors don't even want to talk to you. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not just an isolate uh, and, and a one person um, situation. It involves many, many people. Exactly. It, mm -hmm. It's, it's like putting a cloud over, over anybody you come into contact with. Mm. Part eight. All right, so let everyone know that's tuned in. Let them know where they can get the book at, where they can purchase the book and buy the book at. Yeah, you can go to Amazon.com, and my book is right there. Uh, you can buy a hard copy or you can buy a Kindle. Oh, right. And my website is BullyBehindBars.com, and then I'm also on social media. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, so you can follow me. And on, on your Instagram and Facebook, is it uh, under uh, – Matt Melvin, or is there Matt any only behind bars? Matt, Matt, only behind bars. No, only behind bars is my handle. Okay, uh, only behind bars. No, bully all... behind bars. Oh, bully behind bars. Bar. My bad. On my media. bad. Yeah. So, bully behind bars on all social media platforms. Yes, you can go to bullybehindbars.com to get the book along with the book Amazon. Is actually not on my website. You have to go okay. to Amazon.com. All right. So they go to the the uh, Amazon.com. Correct. to get the book but if they want to know about the book and want to visit the website is bullybehindbars.com correct yes and to follow you and connect with you on social media is bully behind bars correct all right there we go there we have it um mr matt melvin and i i want to say thank you for being the guest on the reentry journey sharing your story sharing your journey and your knowledge with us i wish you nothing but success you were right. Um, this this is heartache. It, 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 when we get incarcerated, when we go through these things, we're not the only one going through it. Even though it may like seem like we're the only one doing time, those that love us, those that have been surrounded by us, family, friends, that they, they, they do their time with us as well. And it, it is heartache. Um, thanks a lot again for coming on the reentry journey. Uh, I, I look forward to see what you got going on in the future. And as I said before, I wish you nothing but success. Thank you for joining the reentry journey. And for those of you tuned in, I want to say thank you for being uh, for tuning in to the reentry journey. And before we go, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor of the reentry journey. I'm so you always see me with the shirt, inspire, motivate, support others. That's what we're about. Inspire, motivate, and support others. So this is another episode of the reentry journey. And always remember, like I always say, don't let the limitations of the background of your background reduce the height of your potential. I'll grow what you were born into. Be great, be successful, be positive, 
and do something with your life and also give back because service is king. This is the Reentry Journey. I'm Cardell Sims. Thank you, Mr. Matt Melvin, for being the guest. And again, I appreciate, uh, uh, don't wish nothing but best for you and success on your journey from here on out. You have a great day. And everyone tune in. You have a great way, a great day as well. I'm Cardell Sims. This is the Reentry Journey. And we're signing off. Themselves and their lives while giving back.